Oh, and there we are. How you doing, kids? A little bit late. One or two minutes late. I hope, uh, you know, um, nobody got disappointed over that. Another rousing edition of Ask the Pastor on January 16th. It's as cold as anything here in Ottawa right now. Minus 16. And uh, I trust you're warm wherever you are. Of course, if you're joining us from the Philippines, that's not an issue. We do have work Africa. We've got a lot of people watch from Africa, which is kind of cool, you know. Let's go for it. You folks know the drill by now. Father, thank you in spite of the weather, in spite of distances that some of them are thousands of kilometers of miles away, Lord. People can tune into this. And be fed, Lord, the truths of your word. Lord, thank you for Kirk, God, that provides the questions. Thank you, Lord God, for the people that get on the comment section and uh, and uh, uh, join us live, Lord God. We pray you'd enable them tonight as well, Lord God. You'd bring the people to the broadcast that need to be brought to the broadcast. That, uh, Lord, uh, the topics that we talk about, I pray, Lord, they'd be exactly what, what viewers need to see and hear, God. As we try to follow you in this crazy age we're living in, God, give this whole hour to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hope you had a good week. Um, again, like we did last week, I want to start uh, the show off by uh, uh, praying for my brother, uh, Nick Vandergrack, okay, who used to do Nick at Night on CFRA, beloved uh, radio host here in Ottawa, good friend of mine, um, loves the Lord. Had a traumatic accident, fractured his skull. The last I've heard, he's been in a coma for three or four weeks now and has not come out of the coma. And uh, spent New Year's Eve, you know, going into the new year in a coma. And he's only like 63, 64 years old. So we're going to pray for him right now. Father, touch our brother Nick. God, raise him up. Give Allison and the rest of the family great faith, Lord God, to believe for nothing but your best, Lord God. You have promised all things work together for good to them that love you and are called according to your service. And God, we know that's Nick. So God, we claim healing for him in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You got the comment section there? If you want to join us, feel free. We're going to have at her right here. Here we go. Once one is born of a woman, one can't be physically reborn. So if, it's, if one is born again by the Spirit, they could never be unborn again. So once saved, always saved. Is that right? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. There's too many scriptures that uh, uh, you know indicate that yeah, you can lose your salvation. You know, that, like in Second Peter it says, you know, don't be arrogant lest you fall. And uh, there's others like that. So I don't know about that. You know, not so. I'm not buying that. Okay. Does bad doctrine lead to bad morals? Um, It's almost a trick question because I'm thinking of, you know, so many people that were, you know, as kids were raised in churches where they had good doctrine and yet, you know, they, they rebelled. Um, I would say bad parenting leads to bad morals. Okay. Uh, it's not so much like doctrine is what you believe and the code you live by, but you know, obedience is more important than doctrine. It is. Because you can have all your doctrine, right? And if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, if you don't have Christ living within you, forget it, you know? James says, you know, tell me what you, uh, tell me about your faith. I'll show you about my faith by how I live, you know? So, I don't know about that. Generally speaking, all things equal, yeah, I'm sure it does, but there's more to it than that. It's not that simple. Can't answer that question just like cut and dry like all the rest of them. Revelation 2.4, please explain. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Well, that's, uh, uh, I think it's the church in Ephesus he's talking to. They've forsaken their first love. That means that church was once, you know, very much like the Laodicean church. It was at one time a very, uh, like uh, John uses it, well, Jesus uses the metaphor of, of heat, you know, to describe passion. You know, you're once hot for God and you grew cold, okay? Like you, you, you've you lost your first love. Like, uh, and it, it's, 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 uh, our relationship to Christ is often used in the New Testament as, as compared to a romance, like a marriage. 
And when a couple first falls in love, man, the first first love is like nothing, you know, and, and it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of sacrifice and commitment and forgiveness to keep that first love hot and passionate. And uh, Jesus is nailing the church in Ephesus for that. You've gotten lazy in your relationship to me. You've taken things for granted. And that's how marriages fall apart. Okay. Things, people don't take things for granted. People take things for granted and, and they don't, uh, you know, uh, they ignore, you know, some of the important aspects of it and, and, oh, I'll get around to it. You know, laziness probably kills more marriages than anything. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm even reminded of Hebrews 6, 12, and I've used the scripture a lot. It says, we do not want you to be robbed of your inheritance because of laziness. When we come to Christ, whether it be in a church setting as a group of people or an individual, there's an inheritance that comes with that. There's, there's blessings that come with that, but they can be lost with laziness. Uh, it's like a pro athlete that's born with great ability, blessed with great ability, but laziness will even kill gifted athletes. That's why the best athletes are working harder than anybody. Even though they're very, very gifted, they 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 work hard. Okay, and uh, Proverbs says uh, uh, I can't remember the exact reference, but uh, if you look it up online, you can find it. A little folding of the hands, a little slumber, and poverty will come on you like a bandit. Hmm, true. And then there's the proverb that talks about you know, look at the ant, thou sluggard, and how the ant you know is so small and yet it can move. You know, it's like a mighty army. That's all forsaking your first love. Comes under that topic there. It relates. Spend a few minutes explaining the correlation between feminism and the decline of masculinity among males, along with the rise of gender dysphoria among elementary age boys. Well, that would take a sociologist to do that, or a psychologist, and I'm not. I'm a pastor. This is out of Ask the Pastor. That's out of my league. That's out of my expertise. The ground rules of Ask the Pastor are I use the Bible as my source of authority. I know the Bible. Spent my whole life studying it. And uh, I think you can use it to talk about whatever topic would come up. Okay. So if we talk about masculinity and men and feminism. I'm going to take a biblical perspective on it. And uh, I, I keep pointing back to Romans 1 too, you know, uh, Romans 1, where uh, it says, you know, uh, these people that rebelled against God and God, you know, let them go nuts. They exchange their natural affections for unnatural affections. And, and that's exactly what we see today. You want to know what's going on in the whole area of feminism, masculinity, gender dysphoria? Read Romans 1. Perfectly describes it. Okay? So I can I can comment as a biblical commentator, but I'm not going to pretend to be a sociologist. I'm a pastor, not a sociologist, Kirk. Kirk's heard that line before. He understands does the possession of passion and spiritual gifts, does the possession of passion and spiritual gifts override the biblical, biblically defined role of Christian women that wants to become a pastor? Um, I don't see any, like, uh, biblically, I don't see anything in, in Scripture that disqualifies a woman who's called to be a pastor. Okay? There's too many, uh, how, you know, your sons and your daughter are going to prophesy. How are you going to, how's a daughter going to prophesy if she's not given a platform? Now, it's not always to pastor, but it's to lead. I mean, there's all sorts of leaders that were females in the in the Bible. And uh, uh, Paul says to Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor, male nor female, slave nor free, you're all one in Christ Jesus. And these people that try to make a case for well, only men can be pastors. Sorry, I belong to a denomination that was started by a woman. And it's, prob it's arguably the most powerful, spirit-filled, and it gets results denomination in the world, the Foursquare Gospel Church, okay? And not only was she a woman, she was divorced when she started it. It's almost like God said, oh, let's see the religious experts. They're going to have a time with this. They're going to love this, you know. And there's tens of thousands of churches that are winning tens, hundreds of thousands of people to Jesus worldwide now. And was Amy Semple McPherson special? Yeah, I think she was, but she wasn't special because she was a woman or a man. She knew God, and she knew that, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Remember, it was the it was the doctrinal guys who were pure in their doctrine that ticked Jesus off the most. You got to be careful with you know uh, 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 crossing every T and dotting every I. You know, it's like it's like Jesus said, and uh, you know, like uh, this is this is he's, he's hitting on human nature. He nails the Pharisees. He says he says you nullify the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. Okay, and uh, for every scripture you know you give me for. Uh, uh, 
uh, you can only have uh, male pastors. I can give you examples in the Bible where there were women leaders, okay? I remember there's a, I can't remember, it's one of the, boy, I wish I, someday I'll, you know, memorize the whole Bible. There's a, you know, there's a, um, talks about a woman who, who leads a church in her house, you know? That's New Testament. That's just one. The Old Testament's even more of them. Does feminism have anything to do with the rise of gender dysphoria? Yes, I believe it does. That's coming from a, a you know a, a Bible scholar, not coming from a sociologist though. But I think you'd, you'd be uh, uh, in denial to to think otherwise. But then again, I'm influenced by mainly the Bible and Romans one. Romans one is there's a clear connection there. Did feminism begin in the 19th century or at the fall or after the fall in Genesis? I who cares? <laughs> really, who cares when it started? Okay, my, if I'm a if I'm a Christian, my number one priority is loving God with all heart, my, all my heart, soul, and mind. My next priority is loving my neighbor as myself. Okay, my next priority could be argued is the Great Commission: go to all the world, preach the gospel. Okay, make disciples. Okay, get the job done. Get out there and do what you're supposed to do. Okay, as far as feminism when it started, that's like I really don't think if if you if you had if you knew the answer to that question. It's going to do little to equip you to be more Christ-like. Okay, now if you want to have trivial information, and you know that's fun. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but as far as uh, growing in grace and growing in 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 the knowledge and truth of, of Jesus Christ, you know, you know, if you want to be a scholar and you want to know your, your you know the culture better, I, I can see you know I, I can see the benefit of that. But anyway. What did God say in Genesis about the future struggles between husbands and wives? Well, he said husbands will make their living by the sweat of the brow, and women will have pain in childbirth, okay? Um, it, it, he didn't really say much in Genesis about the struggles between husbands and wives. Um, I mean, he did say that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, so like the struggle between husbands and wives, there's not much that I remember seeing there. You know, somebody wants to give me a scripture and say, hey, what about this? Well, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it, okay? Genesis 3, 8. This verse tells us that a man and his wife hid themselves when they heard the Lord as he was walking in the garden. Was this a theophany? A theophany, a theophany is a manifestation of God, okay? A Christophany is a manifestation of Christ, uh, Christophanies are mostly referred to as uh, there are many that the scholars believe happened in the Old Testament, like when uh, uh, Joshua meets the captain of the Lord of Hosts. Most people believe, most scholars believe that was a theophany. That was a pre-incarnate, pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ. A theophany is uh, a manifestation of of God the Father. Okay, and uh, yeah, I would say it was. Seems so. Yeah. Genesis 2.15, before the fall, God put man to work. And this was not backbreaking, sweaty, hard work. It was something else. What was it? It was organization. It was uh, tending and probably shaping the garden to, you know, uh, uh, Adam's liking. Um, he named all the animals. Now, uh, um, all of the animals, there wouldn't have been as many different species back then. Most of the species would have been archetypes. Okay, archetypes meaning like... Uh, um, all of the animals that descended from wolves, like canine creatures, like from chihuahuas to wolves to Great Danes to poodles to Afghans to pit bulls, they were all one arch, arch species of canine. Um, um, cats, okay? Uh, uh, small cats and larger cats. There might be a, a great gulf between them, but they were all arch types, and he named them all. How long it took him? Doesn't say. But that was a, I, I think it's very, very interesting. That was a job that God gave Adam to do, you know, and um, you can almost see a, it's a foreshadowing of, you know, his ultimate design for mankind to live and reign with him forever. He's giving Adam authority over nature. He's giving Adam authority over the animals. I, you know, God could have named them no problem, but no, I want you to do that, Adam. Why is he doing that? God desires to be in partnership with us. Okay. There's a perfect example of it right there. And it was work. And there's nothing wrong with work. I mean, people who don't like work, um, work is a privilege. If you've got the right job and you're doing the right job, people can't keep you away from your work. You're enjoying your work. And if you think work is a bad thing, talk to anybody that can't get a job and they're unemployed, boy, they would love to have a job. Now, there's others that, you know, that uh, 
there are people in our culture that are lazy and will live off the system. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the social safety net for some has become a hammock. And, uh, but God's the judge of that, and, and, and I'm going to let God, God be the judge of that. And God can still be the judge of that, even though some of us stand back and go, okay, there's a problem here, okay? And uh, work's a good thing. Work's a really good thing. Work is a blessing. When you're doing what, what you are called to do, it's a blessing. It's wonderful. I'm sure uh, many of us have met people that, man, uh, they're, they're not workaholics because they're workaholics. They, 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 they work a lot because they enjoy their job. They enjoy what they're doing, and that's a that's a real blessing. When you enjoy what you're doing, that's yeah, it's great. When you're doing what you're called to do, man. When a boy becomes a man, is he still obligated to obey his parents? Um, the word is not obey in in uh, the Old Testament. It is honor. And I think you can honor your parents even though you're not always obeying them. I think I think that there are always honorable ways. To honor your parents and 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 some of the difficulties with that. Well, what if I had an abusive father? What if I had a you know none of our parents are perfect, and uh, if your parents you think are that bad, well, I think you could still have the blessing. Um, and remember, that's the only commandment that has a blessing with it. It says so that it will go well with you and you will live in the land a long time. Okay, there's a promise connected to that commandment, and uh, I think you can get the blessing of that promise if you choose maybe to honor your grandparents. Even if you didn't know them, I th it's a biblical principle that I think there's a lot more to it than uh, uh, um, you know than just the surface value there. I, I did a, uh, I remember doing a series of messages on the Ten Commandments, and a lot of the thoughts I stole from Robert Schuler of all people, who was like Mister Positive Thinking, and his whole take on it was that the commandments are commands meant. They're, they're commands meant to bring freedom, commands meant to bring deeper love relationships, commands meant to enrich families. And that's one of them right there. Okay. When a boy, I mean, I think we, when in doubt, don't. Yeah. You try to honor your parents the best. I mean, if, you are, if your parents are not, you know, uh, following Christ and they're living for themselves, obviously you're going to follow the higher and honor the higher authority, which is God. But I think it's a good thing to try and honor your parents to the best of your ability in, in uh, response to that command. I just reading the law in Exodus so two days ago. You know, if you struck your parents, if you slapped one of your parents, that was a death sentence in the Old Testament. If you cursed them, you know, like swore at them, that was a death sentence. That's how serious um, um, the Jews in the Old Testament followed that commandment. Boy, you didn't, you paid honor to people that were, uh, you know, your parents. They were serious about it. How does mankind avoid being uh, swayed by Satan? Uh, by knowing Christ and by knowing the word of God. Okay. Uh, your word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against God. Okay. Uh, your word is a light unto my path. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it, it, it opens up our eyes to what is really going on in the world. It opens up our eyes to the truth so that we will not be deceived. The best way to avoid deception, the best way to avoid temptation is to know the word. Now, the devil knows the word better than any of us. And he even used the word to try and tempt Jesus. And how did Jesus react to that? By using the word back. He knew what the word really said as opposed to the way the devil was trying to twist the word. So you can't, you can't get enough of the Bible. I mean, and the Bible, and because we live in an age where we live in front of screens and we get instant entertainment, and uh, you know we can got thousands and thousands of channels and and different sources of what we can see and what we can put into our mind's eye. It requires a little bit of discipline to sit down and 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 really convince yourself, I need this. I'm going to make this work. I'm going to. And what I found works for me is I I continue. I'm asking God to to keep my hunger for the Word alive, and to not let me be deceived. And 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 uh, boy, He answers that prayer. He answers that prayer because we live in a culture that is not, and, and I couldn't say this 20, 30 years ago, but we are not book orientated anymore. We are screen orientated. Everything happens super fast. And um, even, you know, universities and schools, you know, there are being, people, are, kids are being taught by more and more video, whereas, you know, real scholars, they dig into books and they, they, they study. And uh, Paul said that to his apprentice, Timothy, he said, study to show yourself approved, okay? I ask God all the time to give me a hunger for the word. I, I went through, uh, oh, again, the last couple of days I've been in Exodus, and there's a big section in Exodus that's nothing but laws, you know? 
And and I remember reading those scriptures when I was younger. I'm 64. I remember in my 20s and 30s, I think these are so boring, and just you know, scanning over them as quick as I could. And and uh, man, I was devouring this time. I w- I really enjoyed them. I was really enjoying them and getting a lot of truth out of it. And I think that's an answer to prayer. You know, God help me. Okay. I mean, I got people who know me. I got ADHD, and I take medication for it. I mean, sometimes my attention's got a flea has got more concentration than I do. So I need help. I know my weaknesses. So. Paul said that he boasts in his weaknesses, lest the cross be emptied of its power. And I think when you can admit your weaknesses and when you realize where you need help, that's where you go to God. The, the wonderful thing about serving Jesus is he tells you how to live, but he gives you the ability to do it too. He gives you his spirit to lead you into truth. He, he gives you his spirit to enable you. He, he said of his Holy Spirit to the disciples, he says, I, don't, I know you've seen me raised from the dead. You're all excited. You can't believe that, that death has been conquered and you want to go tell the world, but you don't leave Jerusalem until you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. They needed the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And it was a command. Be filled. And that command is in more than one place in the New Testament. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Man, I need it just for understanding the word and having a hunger for the word. You know, that'll keep me... Uh, that allow me to serve God with the way he deserves to be served. Is Satan our only flo- foe? Um, I think that uh, uh, Satan is our foe, but he's defeated at Calvary and uh, defeated through the power of the resurrection. Uh, uh, Christ has total authority over him. Um, I would suggest that our flesh, the weakness of our flesh, is a greater foe than Satan is. Because he knows the weakness of our flesh, and he will deceive, and and that's why it's so important that our flesh needs to be surrendered to Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important that we're born again. That's why it's so important that we make Christ the Lord of our lives. Then we can lay claim to those promises. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is able to do far more than you could ever ask or imagine, according to the power of the Holy Spirit that is within you. Okay, Ask anything in my name, and it shall be done. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Okay, those are all those promises are not for everybody. Those for people, those promises are for people that have surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. Why? Because your flesh is your enemy. You give your flesh what you want, you'll get fat. If you don't discipline your flesh, you'll your temper will go spouting off anytime you want. If you don't discipline your flesh, all kinds of horrible things can happen. Okay? If you're ruled by the flesh, you're gonna be one pain in the neck, arrogant, greedy, selfish, you know what. And the only way to conquer the flesh is for Christ to come in. Okay, yeah, you can do self-help books and everything, but you're gonna yeah, yeah, uh, much easier to surrender your life to Christ. Okay, not everybody can do the self-help thing. Not everybody can change themselves. Jesus can change anybody if you let him. So I would say the flesh is your greater foe. That doesn't mean Satan isn't your foe because Satan knows all of your weaknesses and he is totally defeated at Calvary. But God didn't take away his ability to lie. He is the best liar in the business. His lies are all believable and his lies cripple people. His lies so fear and doubt. His lies, he doesn't have to have any power because he's such a good liar. And the only way you can expose his lies is through the word and through walking with Christ. Okay? How do you walk with Christ? You, you keep yourself in the word um, um, and, and you you got to have... You've got to have a, a family, like a, a church family or a, or a people that you're meeting together with regularly and you're growing together in Jesus. You're reading scripture together. You're studying scripture. That's what church is supposed to be. Church is not supposed to be, you know, some type of rock star show where a really good speaker gets up, makes everybody laugh and says a good speech and there's great music. OK, that's not what church is. OK, first of all, when Jesus upset the uh, uh, tables in the temple, he said, my house it's going to be a house of prayer. So there needs to be prayer there. Um, in Acts 2.4.2, 2, uh, it, it describes, you know, and there's not a lot of things that the, the Bible says the church should be, but it describes the first generation church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So there's got to be the teaching of the word there and to fellowship. And they shared everything. Okay? They shared everything. And uh, 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 so that's part of what the church dynamic is. Um, you know, the, the 20th, 21st century church, I mean, the emphasis on music and worship is, you know, and, and like, I love great worship music, but man, you don't see that in the book of Acts, okay? It's just not there. There's no emphasis on music. They decide, okay, we'll sing a, hum, a psalm when we leave, you know, we'll sing, sing and make music to each other, you know? Um, 
it's not a it's not a New Testament priority. And it's almost as if like uh, and Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. Well, our houses are houses of worship. Listen, there's nothing wrong with worship. It's a great thing. It's a biblical thing. But it's not the priority for the church. Okay? The priority for the church, you'll see it in the book of Acts. It's far more simpler and less complicated than what the church has evolved into. Okay? And that's a, that's an open, you know, I'm, I'm opening up a can of worms there. If you want to get on the comment section. Boy, somebody's taken up four, uh, 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 has put four entries into the comment section advertising their church or their, their YouTube channel. That's the first time that's ever happened. Yeah, it's kind of a waste of time there, Roger. Like, uh, you know, we're doing Ask the Pastor here, and if you got a question or comment on what we're talking about, people will pay attention. If you're just doing that, they're probably going to stay away from what you're doing because it's kind of, you know, you're kind of like uh, hijacking the platform a little bit there. But anyway, that's between you and God. God bless you, brother. Uh, Revelation 2. Tell us about the love the Ephesians had forsaken and how they were to repent. Then tell us if this is ap uh, applicable today. Okay, we talked about that a little bit early with your first love. Okay, describe that a little bit. Um, that love they'd forsaken is they they got ritualistic. They got in the same old, same old. You know, like, how do we do church? Well, this is the way we've always done it. And there was no freshness there. Their love need to be needed to be renewed. First of all, they needed to repent, so they need to be aware that, okay, this is wrong. You know, we have reduced the, the glorious message of the gospel of Christ to some type of empty ritual with no love, no passion. And I think in their in their in uh, their in the command that they were supposed to repent and get back to first love, there had to be an acknowledgement that they had strayed far away, and there had to be calling on God, God, fix us. God, we're sorry. God, come back. God, like, show us what we need to do. And I think God would have answered their prayer there. Okay? And and I've seen that happen in a lot of churches where churches come to the awareness is, uh, you know, we need God. We're kind of doing it in our church tomorrow night. Okay? Um, Christ Church has been running for, it'll be seven years at uh, on February the 8th. Okay? And uh, churches go through cycles. And, and that's why Ephesians says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the verb, it says, it literally means be filled with the Holy Spirit continually. Why? Because we leak spiritually. And we need to we need to draw fresh water from the fountain of God, okay? And that's not a rebaptism thing, but, but it, you know, it, being filled with the Holy Spirit is, is it, 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 God puts the responsibility on us. And um, you can get stale in your, in your marriage. You can get stale in your relationship with God. You can get stale in church life and that's why we got to be open hearted and transparent and we got to be accountable to each other okay and when god makes us aware of that we got to get it right and and we're doing that in christ church tomorrow night um we've got a, what we're calling a prayer summit we usually have a prayer prayer meeting and bible study on wednesday night and uh we're, we're kind of going off uh our, our format because uh we've been ministering downtown for a good six years now and uh, serving soup to the poor and, and giving out clothing and, and, and running the prayer meeting of Bible study, like right at the Bible house where we have anybody that wants to come in, uh, can come in and they do come in and they join us. And uh, we're trying to be light downtown. And, 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 and we have made so many rich relationships. You know, we started that thing with a, a long term uh, vision in mind, whereas, you know, we're not going to. We're not going to just do this so that people will come to our church because people aren't stupid. They can see right, right through that right away. And I, we get that from a lot of our street friends. That, and, and, you know, they know when people are coming down to minister to them because, you know, just to soothe their guilty conscience. And, and, and we knew, okay, we're going down there and we're going to love people. They may never come to our church, but one thing they're going to know, they're going to know they're loved. They're going to know they're, it's genuine, Okay. So we decided we're going to, what's the best thing we could do? Give them clothes as, you know, and stuff comes into our possession that we give away. We give away clothes. We we have like great chefs that cook uh, terrific soup on Thursday nights. And uh, we sit around, we have fun. We pray with people. We listen to their beefs. Uh, we try to do, you know, the beautiful thing about what Jesus commands and then in the, in the epistles, it says, it doesn't say solve one another's problems. It says bear one another's burdens. You know, how do you bear somebody's burden? You make life easier for them. Hey, let me share the load with you here. Let me help you out. You do what you can. And I think churches and people who follow Christ could do way more than they think they can. They just got to do it. And when we started, we didn't know what we were doing. We just, okay, let's make soup. Okay, let's just hang out with people. And, and, and lo and behold, 
Some people, it's taken them two, three, four years before they really trust us, but they're starting to come to church. They're getting saved. They're, 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 and I joke often, but it's true, 90%, about 90% of my job is undoing the damage that stupid Christians have done. Okay? And everybody downtown has got a horror story about how somebody, some religious leader abused them or ripped them off or, you know, they said horrible things to them. And there's a reason why most of our culture, you know, has their defenses up against church and Jesus. You mentioned Jesus or church, boom, they got defenses come up right away. Well, if you're going to cope with that problem, that's going to take time. You have to prove to people who don't know the Lord, if you're serious about sharing the gospel, you got to prove to them through your lifestyle that you're worth listening to. That you're not just some, you know, um, um, religious freak that, you know, wants them to join your church. And you prove that to them through real love, okay? Now, there's a line we use, demonstrating Jesus Christ by, by showing God's love. It's based on an old quote from uh, St. Francis of Assisi, okay? Preach the gospel every day if you have to use words. You know, and we've got too many people preaching the gospel that their actions don't line up with their, their words, so I think it's more important to, 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 to be loving in action. That, is the, does that mean we don't share the gospel? Of course not. Of course you share the gospel. But, you know, if the seed is going to take root, sometimes the, the, the ground needs plowing up. Sometimes the weeds need removing. Sometimes you've got to take the rocks away first before the seed ever goes out there. Otherwise, it's never going to take root. Okay? And, and the evangelical church in, in North America, at least, you know, their whole thing is getting people to say the sinner's prayer, and then they're born again. Well, you know, any dummy can talk you into saying the sinner's prayer. That's why Jesus said, go and make disciples. He said, preach the gospel to every creature. Okay, that's Mark 16, 15. But the Great Commission is also Matthew 28, 19, where he says, go make disciples and teach them to obey. You can't teach anybody to obey if they don't trust you. Okay? Ask any teacher teaching any grade in the school system. Kids don't learn anything until they trust you. you got to win their favor, okay? And that may sound unfair, but you know what? There's so much abuse and there's so many people playing each other nowadays. I, think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing for the church. Okay, if you want people to believe your message, you better be authentic. And most of us aren't authentic, but that's where the Holy Spirit steps in and says, you know what, I can help. We come to the place where we know we're not authentic. We come to the place where we know we need God. We come to the place where we're not loving people. We're not Christ-like. And that's why we invite him into our life, and he comes in, and he starts changing things. And he turns us into from, you know, a, a lustful, greedy, uh, selfish, lying, conniving, you know, sinners in, into people that are people of integrity, people that are Christ-like, people that, you know, hurting people want to be around. Okay? And, uh... That's how you keep it hot, okay? Kirk's getting into some great questions here, boy. Kind of goes in waves, goes in topics, you know, and, and uh, it's really good. Can a successful ministry produce complacency? Yes, often. And it happens when you lean on your own abilities and you lean on your talents and you forget who your source of strength is. I don't care how gifted you are. I don't care how, you know, like uh, how much you got it together. You may be, the, you know, the, 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 uh, an ecclesiastical genius, Okay, somebody that knows church methods better than anybody. If you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, if you don't realize that when Jesus said in John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. The branches that don't bear any fruit are gathered up, I throw them in the fire. The branches that do bear fruit, I prune them so that they'll bear even richer fruit. And then he says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Oh, you could do things that are very impressive to people, you know, that have, you know, a, a superficial understanding of what it means to follow Christ. But as far as eternal value is concerned, nothing. Wood, hay, and stubble, it will all be refined up and it will, be, it will disappear. Well, what, what, what we want to be a part of is, is the gold and the, and the diamonds and the precious metals that when they're refined, they're even purer. Okay, and that's the real eternal work you do. That's the love. That's the stuff that Jesus was talking about when he said, you're going to do even greater works than I did. And, you know, the, the charismatic and the Pentecostal movement interpret that scripture. Oh, we're going to do even more miracles because he raised the dead and, you know, he healed the sick. And, you know, we don't have that. We're not holy. You, 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 you got a shallow understanding of the Bible. 
Because Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22, okay? Well, we can, there's a bunch of stands before him that he's sending them to hell. He's saying, we cast out demons in your name. We did wonders in your name. He says, depart from me. I never knew you. Okay? And he makes that speech about, I was, I was naked. You didn't clothe me. I was in prison. You didn't visit me. I was hungry. You didn't feed me. I was a stranger. You didn't welcome me in. Okay? When you've done it, the least of these, you've done it unto me. I think that shows you right there that in Christ's mind, in Christ's mind, those actions are greater than even raising the dead and healing the sick. Why? First Corinthians 13 says, if I can, if I've got the faith of, of if I got faith that can move mountains, if I got the eloquence you know, of angels, and I don't have love, I'm nothing. So don't think this is just a pastor, you know, spouting off his you know prejudices here. The best script uh, to interpret a scripture is other scripture. Okay? Pretty clear on that. So the question there is: can a successful ministry produce complacency? See it all the time. All the time. In fact, Usually the ministries that get the most complacent at one time they were they were just rocking. And look at the look at the uh, vocabulary you're using there, Kirk. Can a successful ministry? What is success? Okay. I'm not interested in any kind of thing that you know that, that, that the world says success. I I want I want to I want to do what Jesus says is is good. In fact, there are scriptures that tell me that you know what what is what man sees as wonderful. Jesus detests. His ways are not our ways. His, his thoughts are not our thoughts. Um, Chuck Colson, the guy that founded uh, uh, Prison Fellowship International, former hatchet man for Richard Nixon during the Watergate uh, uh, break it, um, you know, like uh, Colson was the guy that, uh, you know, engineered the whole thing, hired all the guys to break into the Democratic headquarters, and he served eight years in prison for doing it. Got saved in prison. Founded Prison Fellowship International. For the rest of his 30 years in ministry, the guy was a, a spiritual giant. There are tens, not thousands, there are tens of thousands of prisoners in North American prisons that have come to Christ because of Prison Fellowship International, okay? Chuck Colson used to have a, a little sign on his desk, and he used to say, and he used to say, uh, faithfulness, not success. So when I hear that term successful ministry, it means nothing to me. Now, if I hear the term faithful ministry, whoa, you know what that tells me? They're being faithful to God. They're doing everything they can. You can't measure success by numbers. You can't measure, I, you know, like my dad and I used to have arguments like this because he was like, you know, pastor big churches and he was a real numbers guy. And uh, I remember him preaching, you know, like, well, you know, numbers are important to God. He even named one of the books of the Bible numbers, you know, I'm going, come on, you know. And I remember saying to him, Dad, you know, numbers, like you give away free beer and free porno magazines, you'll pack the place out, you know? There are all sorts of Mormon churches that are packed. Are they preaching the truth? According to the Bible, nope. So numbers can be very deceptive. Success means nothing, okay? What are you doing when nobody's looking? Why do you think Jesus meant, why do you think Jesus said, hey, you know, uh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first? He keeps better records than anybody. And I can hardly wait, okay, to get to heaven, to see all the people. You know, well, I heard it put the, and I've said this on, on Ask the Pastor before. There's three big shocks when you get to heaven. Three big shocks. The first one is, you made it. <laughs> can you believe it? I'm here. Oh, man. Wow, this is amazing. The second shock is all the people that aren't there, that you thought were going to be there. And the third shock is all the people that are there that you didn't think were going to be there. Why? His pay scale, his understanding of greatness, his priorities are not ours. And one of the wisest things you can do if you're going to follow Christ is God give you your priorities. God changed my heart, so I am thrilled about the things that you're thrilled about. And I don't really care about the things that are lower on your priority list. That's a great thing to pray. Now, as you pray that way, and as he answers that prayer, and as you grow in that mindset, you're going to tick off a lot of people that go to your church. Because there's a lot of people that, that don't want that. Oh, they can put on a good show, but boy, don't ruffle their comfort zones, man. How can we recognize the schemes of Satan? What's my, what must we do? Uh, three things, okay? 
uh, prayer. Now, when I say prayer, I don't mean now lay me down to sleep and pray the Lord my soul to keep. I don't mean, you know, um, our Father who art in heaven, which is a great prayer, but, you know, that's not enough. People think you pray that, you'll be fine, and, and that's all you need to do. I don't mean uh, God is great, God is good, and we thank you for his foot. I, I mean learning how to pray. Learning how to go into a room with your Bible and spend about an hour and a half, two hours, maybe three hours, asking God to help you, okay? Become somebody that knows how to pray, okay? And um, the best way to do that is to start by praying, God, show me how to pray. God, lead me to maybe resources I need to show me how to pray. YouTube is full of all kinds. YouTube's got all kinds of junk on it, but man, there's a lot of great ministries on YouTube. If you type in YouTube, how to pray, you're going to have more stuff than you can handle. Now, a lot of it's goofy, but there's some great stuff there, okay? So number one, how do you recognize schemes of say? See, prayer is going to open up your spiritual eyes, okay? But the, the impressions you're getting in prayer to know whether they're of God or not, you need to be in the Word. You need to be reading the Bible. The Bible is our guide. The Bible is our arbitrator. The Bible makes us aware of, okay, yeah, that is right, that is wrong, okay? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Tells you everything you need to know. Not everything you want to know, everything you need to know, okay? And, and ask God to make you a Bible addict, okay? And that's going to be an acquired discipline. I mean, you've been training yourself since you were born how to sit in front of a screen. I have no problem sitting in front of a screen for, oh, if it's if it's a playoff weekend, like last weekend with the NFL, I could easily sit in front of a screen for 10 hours, you know, and just bring food and just do it for 10 hours solid. Why? I've been doing it since I was a kid. Most of us cannot go more than 10 minutes with the Bible because we have not disciplined ourselves. Okay? And, and that's a good discipline. That's a, that's a skill that you need to develop. You know, understanding the Bible, asking God to help you. So you got prayer, you got the word, okay? And then the last one is biblical fellowship and accountability. That's what a church is supposed to be. Unfortunately, most churches are not like that. Um, but if, you got to be in a in a in a, in, in accountable, transparent relationship with other people that are that are studying the Bible together. You're growing together. You're praying together. You're meeting together often. You're listening. Somebody is teaching you. You got a coach, like a pastor, or whatever. And uh, I mean, there is no uh, template for it except what is in the Book of Acts. And in the Book of Acts, they met in houses. You know, there was no church buildings. There's no record of any church buildings until about 200 A.D. It's not until about the fourth or fifth generation of the church where you have church buildings. Now, I'm broadcasting from Canada. It's cold, okay? Um, but we still have, you know, we still have prayer meetings in our houses. And uh, I, I came from a prayer meeting in a house tonight, okay? And uh, But then we have common buildings that, you know, we share and, and we everybody pools their resources because, uh, and this is the beauty of a larger church, you could do, you could accomplish more for God, and you can accomplish more good as a group than just, you know, individuals, okay? And that's the genius of the church. You know, they, they, they uh, you know, by the first generation, there were tens of thousands of Christians all over the Mediterranean Basin. They were in Corinth, they were in Antioch, Ephesus, Rome, um, Alexandria, uh, everywhere, everywhere there was, there, this church was just exploding and growing everywhere. And most of them were house church based, but I'm sure that even those house churches, I'm sure that, and, and you know, they started off in Jerusalem, um, they all used to meet in Solomon's Colonnade. Well, Solomon's Colonnade could easily hold. Solomon's Colonnade was like that, the exterior porch of the, of the temple, on the Temple Mount. It wasn't the temple itself, it was like the courtyard that, that surrounded the temple. And that's where the most common place where they met. Well, you could... You could, like if Peter, one of the apostles, got up on a platform, he could be heard by five to 10,000 people in a setting like that. Now, that wasn't the, 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 you know, they would come together, I'm sure, once a month or once every three months or whatever, just, you know, refer to, to, to like uh, Christian equivalent to festivals like the, the, like, the, like the Jews had, the, the Day of Pentecost. So they probably did meet on those festivals, but they, you know, they brought Christ into it as the fulfillment of those festivals. And um, but the but the core of the growth was because of their their network of homes, where they would study the scriptures, where they would listen. You know, have the apostles would go around to homes and, and and they'd be speaking. I mean, you see it in the gospels. Jesus is at a home teaching when they drop a guy through the roof and say, "Here, heal, heal him." You know. So there's no template for it, but but uh, you want to recognize the schemes of Satan. You gotta you, you gotta be in the Word. You've gotta you've gotta have a prayer life. 
and you've got to have people that are that are there to encourage you to uh, that you're accountable to, that pick you up when you when you fall, that uh, answer your questions, that pray with you, that that are growing with you. That's I've just described a, a church, and we often use the term in, in in our churches a book of Acts church. What's a book of Acts church? Well, the only the only um, reputable and the only reliable example of a church is the book of Acts. Anything else is because it's scripture. It's the word of God. It tells you the things that are, need to be there. I mean, man, I could write a book on all the stuff that churches do that is not in the Bible. That's not necessary. Now, it doesn't necessarily make those things bad. It's just that you can go so, because God could use anything. He could use stuff that's out of the Bible. He could use examples. He could use extra biblical, you know, experiences to do his glory. But you can veer away so much from scripture in the way a church is structured that you're not even biblical anymore. And it never happens overnight. It could take, oh, it usually takes 10, 20, 30 years. And somebody who was part of your church 30 years ago comes back and says, what has happened here? Doesn't even recognize it anymore. Good question. You know, Kirk, my favorite questions are when you ask a question that's, and it just leads to all kinds of other answers, you know. But I, I got to be faithful to answering the question as best I can. God is very patient and merciful, showing us, allowing us time for repentance. Was he patient with Lucifer and his followers? Um, I don't know. I wasn't there, and there's no reliable record to tell us, you know, whether he was or not. But based on what we see in the Bible of the character of God, um, it's easy for me to imagine that, yeah, he was he was patient with them. And, you know, like, uh, uh, God is immutable. He never changes. His character never changes. And, and he is definitely, you know, patient in, in the New Testament as far as the coming of Christ is concerned. He's certainly patient with Israel. Dear God, Israel rebelled and came back to him seven or eight times over the course of five, seven hundred years, whatever it was, from the time they conquered Palestine until uh, the Babylonian captivity. I think it was a thousand years. And, uh, man, God's patience with Israel was unbelievable. I, I imagine that based on God's character, what we see in Scripture, um, you know, yeah, I think he was. I think he was patient with Lucifer. I have no reason to believe he wouldn't be because it would be going against you know, his character that is uh, uh, um, quite uh, uh, um, explicitly uh, displayed in Scripture. Okay? Good question, as usual, Kirk. Why is God allowing Satan to steal, kill, and destroy? Because he's testing and refining mankind. Uh, and this is not explicitly laid out in Scripture, but... Um, um, you know, the, the God, God's cosmological plan seems to be that he wants a family on earth, just like he's got a family in heaven. A family on earth that forever and ever will rule and reign with him. Wants us to be a part of his entourage, wants us to be a part of his family. And uh, only those that are going to choose to serve him um, are going to be part of that family. And the only way man can have a choice is that he's got to be tested. And uh, are I really going to love God, or are you going to fall for the temptations and the deceptions of, the, of the, uh, the devil when, you know, Jesus has made the way possible by shedding his blood and making the way possible for you to have eternal life? Do you want that? It's for free. And, yeah, we accept it. And, and But it, it, it's never Christ's intention that we just be saved by grace. He wants us to be disciples. He wants us to grow. He wants, he, want, he has plans for us for all of eternity. And uh, Satan is being used, you know, as a testing ground. Okay? I'm slouching too much. i got to get a little bit higher here. My face is disappearing on the screen, I'm noticing there. That doesn't matter, John, as long as the answers are good. We don't care what you look like. Yeah, I wasn't hired for my looks. I know that. Scripture tells us to run from sin. Yeah, basically. Flee immorality and that, yeah. But when it comes to Satan, we're told to resist him. Is there a difference between running and resisting? Uh, and, and, you know, in my spiritual battles, no, I don't see a difference at all. If I'm running away, I'm resisting. Man. I would think if you're resisting, that means he's always got his claws at me. You're wrestling and trying to get away. You know, you're still trying to run. You're trying to flee. Okay? And uh, I think the devil can be deceptive in that, uh, you know, we think as Christians we're more powerful than we are. And I, I specifically the area of immorality. 
um, you know, flee immorality. It doesn't say, you know, learn how to handle it. It doesn't say learn how to cope with it. It doesn't say conquer it. It says run. As if God is saying, hey, this is, you cannot handle this. This is too powerful for you. Powerful for you. You mess around with this. You hesitate it. It's going to kill you. Run. Get away from it. A million miles away. If you see it, run. Enough said on that. Is there anything about humility that appeals to the ego? Um, yeah, you can be proud of your humility. Yeah. I mean, if you could attain humility, boy, that'd be something to be proud of. But, you know, as soon as you're proud of it, it proves you haven't, you're not humble. So I've come to the conclusion, humility is something that I think is fantastic. It's wonderful. It's worth my lifelong pursuit. Will I ever be humble? I doubt it. But I'm never going to give up pursuing it because like, humility kind of is the same as is just synonymous with uh, perfection. Um, and I guess you could use this example. The most humble people I've ever met, they don't know they're humble. In fact, the most humble people I've ever met, they don't think they're humble at all. They, they, they kind of think they're, you know, they got pride issues. That's a good thing. Even talking about humility, it's a wonderful thing. But I can see, you know, people that when they first start on that, on that, pilgrimage towards humility yeah they're most of the decisions we make when we're not humble are purely driven by ego i mean there's even language in the bible you know to attract us to jesus that appeal to our ego yeah hey, hey delight yourself with the lord you give me the desires of your heart Woo ask anything in my name you're gonna get it well that appeals to my ego here we go you know seek ye first the kingdom of god all these things will be added unto you that, that appeals to your ego People that are new Christians that don't know how really it works yet, they're still trying to figure it out. They hear those scriptures, oh, I want to serve God. But as you grow in God, you get more mature and you get, yeah, and, and the words are still have the same meaning, but they have much, much deeper meaning. Okay. Especially if you're, you know, if you if you if you ever find, if you ever get a grasp on the wonders of humility and how powerful humility is. Oh my goodness. Is repentance an option for Satan? Nope. Doesn't seem so. And I've read a lot of stuff, but, uh, you know, I've, of course, read the Bible through over and over and see no hint of that and extra biblical stuff, you know, the uh, books and writings that were even respected by uh, the church and the Jewish faith uh, uh, back in the day. And there's no hint, whatever, that there's repentance there. I don't know why. I know there's another, I saw a video on YouTube. I should probably watch it and see if it's, you know, see if we put it on our recommended list that we have at the bulletin. Like when we do our bulletin once a month, I always put in about four or five, you know, gems from YouTube that like, I tell people, you got to see this. And there's one on YouTube right now where it says, why God can't forgive Satan. I should probably watch that. Tell you what, you can get there and watch it before me. And if you've seen it, you know, text me or, or message me on uh, on the Facebook page here and uh, tell me what you think. Okay. In the Psalms, we learn David knew the way of salvation. But where did the Israelites go wrong after David? Well, they kept rebelling. Okay, I mean, they and sometimes they had bad kings that were horrible examples. And, you know, there was far more rebellion under kings like that. But then, you know, you would also have good kings. And then you'd have not so good kings and average kings. And, you know, there was always a choice. And they kept rebelling against God. They're stiff-necked people. God's patience with Israel is incredible, okay? Because they're always, you know, and again, God allowed Molech and Ashtoreth and, and uh, Baal, these demonic gods, okay? Like he allowed them some authority to, to operate because, again, he's testing his people. Are my people going to love me? Are my people going to follow me because they love me? Or, are they, you know, they, they're going to stay true. And he allowed... Uh, uh, you can't have somebody's not going to love you if you're the only person. You never know if they're if you're stranded on a desert island. You're the only person. How do you know if that person's falling in love with you? You're the only person there. There needs to be a test. There needs to be a choice. And God has always allowed that. And and that's one of the most powerful things He's given us: the freedom to choose. And they chose rebellion against even some of the greatest kings they ever had. Hezekiah, great king. Josiah, terrific king. Asa. They had good kings beside David, but they rebelled. Then they had the real bad ones too, like Manasseh and Ahab. Should there always be an even balance between doctrine and duty? 
I would put duty above doctrine because obedience trumps head knowledge every time. And you can be really, really good in your doctrine, but it's not affecting your obedience at all. You can believe all the right stuff and uh, end up going to hell. Hey, the devil's doctrine, he knows his doctrine. Oh, man, he knows his doctrine better than anybody. And he's a million miles away from salvation. So that probably, you know, answers the question right there. I'd say duty and obedience is, is far more authoritative, far more important. Obedience trumps head knowledge every time. What doctrinal truths are required for salvation? Um, uh, Jesus Christ's blood is the only cure for sin, and it has to be uh, personally accepted, and that's the only way to salvation, and He is the, that is the only way to escape hell. That's the only thing that's required. Okay, And there's a lot of people that got a lot of kooky additions to you know, their doctrine, but that's the cornerstone right there. If they, if they understand and have a grasp that the blood of Christ is the only way to uh, salvation and we accept his sacrifice and, and, and we uh, ask him to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us because of his blood, uh, you know, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It does not say whoever's got their doctrine right will be saved, okay? For God so loved the world, gave his only son, that whoever believes in him Will not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't put a, a qualification of, uh, you know, you got to have your doctrine together. Hmm. Please explain. And doctrine is important too, but not as important as the other. Please explain the difference between doctrine and theology. Th there's not much of a real difference, you know. If I say somebody, say it and describe somebody, man, that guy's doctrine's off. It's the same thing as saying, but that guy's theology is off. Or that guy's got solid doctrine. You know, theologically, that guy's together. So, yeah, yeah. No real difference. We're out of time. We're out of time. Um, tomorrow night is our prayer meeting and Bible study. And I always end the program with telling you what we're doing. Okay. And uh, that's open to everybody. But tomorrow's a little bit different. It is open to everybody. But if you come and you're not a part of the church family, you're there as an observer tomorrow. Okay. The church family that's coming together, we need to touch God. We need to hear from God. It's a prayer summit we're having. So uh, we're not going to be, and, and, and anybody that walks into the prayer meeting of Bible study, if they're new, you know, and there's an understanding from the regulars that come, if anybody comes in that's new, and lots of times we're on the street. So there's people that come in, there's high, sometimes they come in, they're demon possessed. Sometimes they come in there that, you know, they're, they're looking for uh, um, clothing and they think it's Thursday night, it's soup night. We always invite everybody in, give them a warm welcome, have them join the discussion, pray for them, do whatever we can. Tomorrow night's going to be a little bit different. The church family's coming together to pray together to hear from God. So anybody that's new, if you're watching this and you're new to our broadcast and you thought, feel you figure you drop in, you're going to be coming in as an observer tomorrow. You're welcome, but just come and watch and see what you think, okay? Thursday night, soup night. Oh, man, that's the most fun we have all week. Have fun with our street friends downtown and have soup and pray and um, um, joke around, laugh, and, and have a great time. And that's Thursday night. We start serving soup at 6.30. The prayer summit tomorrow starts at 7. And then our version of church, 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon, Peace Tower Church, 343 Bronson. Did you have a good night? I hope so. Let's ask God to make it better. Because all we did was plant seeds and throw some information around. Now, if the Holy Spirit takes the information that we've thrown around, man, he can do amazing things with it. So we're going to pray for that right now. Father, everybody that comes across this broadcast, Lord, during the week and even live, God. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray, God, that your word will do its work, that it will give life to people. And Lord, it will, it will, it will bind, Lord, the forces of evil that are trying to stop up your word from having its way. Lord, your word says that heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not, will never pass away. And we're going to embrace it, Lord, like that's true tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night. Night, night.